Bendel closed his tired eyes and dropped his hand over his crossed knees. He lifted his face to the darkening sky, and with his four fingers and thumbs he formed a triangle and began the ritual called the life to isolate his rubra, the center of one's being. Together, each point in the triangle of fingers signified time. The lower left served the past, the top center the present, and the bottom right the future. All three represented the philosophy Randall referred to as Is, Isof Havi Sult, or in other words, the path of time. Mindful that there is no time if one viewed all three as one. Slowly he made a round circle with his lips pointing outward, for the center of one's being, Randall was taught, was not the heart or liver as in some cultures, but the tongue, or more specifically, one's speech. Indeed, from the mouth's talent, life or death could spring forth. What proceeded from one's speech characterized the center of one's being. Furthermore, years of tutelage by the storyteller, Stephen Tagdala, rendered his meditation effortless. With a single breath through the triangle, Randall felt his tension fly away and his pulse slow as a reserve of energy resurfaced. One has to be thankful. He quoted the liturgy that ended the ritual. He smiled at the blackness of space and with a sense of awe and ended his prayers. Without thankfulness, he said, experience is incomplete. Out of the dark corner of the trail, Randall heard the lonesome baying of Dinky slowly making his way home. His return hardened Randall, even though the beast sustained his disapproval in loud bellows. When the mulish creature sauntered into camp to gobble up his treat, Randall put on the old restraints. With the final chore finished and time for bed, Randall returned to the comfortable stone. He looked around and confirmed no one was there. Thus the dreamer prepared to meet his dreams. The stranger, outlined by the flickering light of the foreign campfire, made Turan Herpedros nervous, and he remained on watch. His anxiety, he mused, was due in part to overeating palsy roots, a mild stimulant which he had chewed earlier. With no sleep possible and his curiosity piqued, he remembered his old ruse. He would sneak unobtrusively into the occasional trippers' camp and hang a pack on a tree, place rocks atop kitchens, or spell out nonsensical words with twigs on the ground among the sleepers, all jests to imitate mischievous specters and provide him with a humorous diversion. When the campfire coals dulled, Turan, with his waggish curiosity, cautiously crept towards the encampment. At first he could not locate Randall, although he marked the location of the snoozing burrow beast and camel. Failing to pinpoint the human, misgivings crept into his cocky head. If somehow the visitor had heard his approach and hidden himself to catapult from his camouflage, he must retreat. Finally, a distance from the fire ring, the irregular breathing of the fitful sleeper disturbed the quiet. There he is. I'm getting poor of sight, he ruminated to himself as he located the object of his curiosity. Having fallen asleep atop a tumbled stone man, Randall appeared as a double, that is, an imitation of the stone soldier. Turan paused and thought of the original face of the stone copies. He pondered, was it a dream? He sleeps, but his face, I must see it. Approaching from Randall's blind spot, Herpedros crept across the ground like a quiet breeze and slowly stretched out his bony hand to lift the cloak that partially hid the stranger's face. In a second, the hermit recognized the familiar mien. Indeed, the shock of his identification set his heart to boom and blood to burst into his head and face. Turan's body buckled, numb with surprise from his apperception of the sleeping man. In short, Turan's heart seized. As he began to faint onto the sleeper, he shifted onto the adjacent gravel and landed on his outstretched hand. The burrow beast stirred, even as Randall did not. Startled by the noise and odor of the intruder which permeated the camp, 
The burrow beast blowed and snorted his dissatisfaction. Dinky furiously flagged his ears and flared his nostrils to trap the scent and locate the interloper. He loudly pawed the ground, which sent vibrations throughout the camp with sufficient pandemonium to awaken everyone. Within a second, Randall was on top of Herpetros, one hand around his neck and the other holding his dagger at the meddler's side. "'Hands over your head, fool!' Randall commanded in anger. "'This steel in your belly will find its way to the stone that lies beneath you should your fates be so bound.' Herpetros surrendered peacefully. "'Who are you, and why are you in my camp?' Randall asked with his intruder in hand. His heart raced in the thin night air, but he worried if his prisoner were another vision or apparition. He did not let on his uncertainty, but gulped big breaths and tightened his grip on his weapon. "'Why, it's, it's me, Tyran Herpetros. I came to see who was sleeping in the camp because—' A longish pause followed Tyran's opening. Randall realized— "'You're wearing no weapon. Where did you come from?' he demanded. Randall felt he had all the advantage. The criminal's back lay against the cold earth, and Randall's deadly blade pinned his middle. He could spear him any second like a squab on a spit. "'You're not the one I thought you were. Your face resembles the singular faces of the Stone Army, but you may not have known that.' Herpetros feigned friendship, but his mistake frustrated him. Although Randall's bravado did not frighten him, he spoke reverently and deliberately to better observe his young aggressor. "'You see well in this pitiful light,' the hermit spoke with amusement at Randall's observation. "'See, I'm no robber, and if I am, I'm a poor one with little sense. As you've caught me quite easily, I live—' Herpetros stopped volunteering. This was not the man, but it was the voice— and the face of the man he had known and loved. "'Perhaps before I surrender my identity,' Herpetros continued, "'you will say more about you, young sir. After all, this place is my home,' Herpetros stated a half-truth. "'Gladly, thief. I am a traveler who is about to sever your strand of life if you don't freely confess. What were you really doing in my camp?' Randall forcefully replied." "'Doing truly nothing, sir. I live here in the pass. "'So you are a thief.' "'Due to Randall's accent, Herpetros thought perhaps his captor to be from Zex or Pear, "'regions closest to the pass. "'He answered Randall's allegation with a question. "'Do you actually think there are sufficient numbers in the pass "'to make a living robbing and stealing with that awful war going on in the valleys? "'I would understand you leaving such strife and making your way here, but—' I'm not a brigand to pickpocket those so unfortunate who flee such conflict. War, Randall replied. What war is that you're saying, thief? Herpetros was astonished. There is a war, my young lord, 